front of building towards the northern end. That's the odd waiting room. But with the train line gone, the Jackie has instead become the home to the big red brick building in the background, the one with the sort of sandy coloured archway directly underneath it. The building is known as Semaphore Tower, and that plays home to a group known as the Queen's Harbour Master, or QHM for short. Now these are the guys and girls that control all the shipping movements in and around Portsmouth. That goes from the start of this harbour tour, right up to the moons of all the warships, cross shell ferries, Iloite ferries, and all the yachts and boats you can see passing down our left hand side. Basically, anything and everything that moves around the harbour has to go through the guys in that tower first. So anyway folks, moving along, we're about to go past Victory Jetty, which of course gets its name because of HMS Victory in the background. You will get a glimpse of her as we move along, but for the best part she's going to be obscured due to the fact we have two of our brand new Queen Elizabeth class suit carriers here. First up, HMS Queen Elizabeth, and then her sister ship up ahead, HMS Prince of Wales. Now, ladies and gentlemen, these are the largest and most expensive warships ever owned and operated by our Royal Navy. After all, they cost a whopping £3.1 billion pounds each. Now that is very, very expensive. A lot of people don't actually realise how big a billion truly is. Now let's put it this way, if you were to earn one pound for every single second that you've been alive for, it will take you approximately 100 years to save up to buy one of these aircraft carriers. They are very expensive. Now in terms of uh, size, generally with ships their size is determined by how heavy they are, and these carriers are no exception to that. They both weigh in at around 70 thousand tons. They are therefore three times the size of one of our previous invincible class of aircraft carriers. To be slightly more specific though, they're 280 metres long, 70 metres wide, and there's around two, uh, around 10 metres of the ship located below the waterline. For all intents and purposes, these are the largest ships you can physically get from Portsmouth. Any bigger than this, you seriously struggle to get through that harbour entrance directly behind us. So, as the two carriers here today, the Queen Elizabeth that we went past first, she is the older one of the two. She arrived back in 2017, when the Prince of Wales up ahead arrived in 2019. But over the past couple of years, both the aircraft carriers have been undergoing a large variety of what's known as uh, various training and trials and exercises with the crew and the aircraft on board. And this is all uh, designed to get themselves ready for what is known as frontline duties. Uh, frontline duties is basically the process where the carrier is going to service for the very first time on their first ever deployment. Now the Queen Elizabeth, she's just come back from her maiden frontline duty. She left around the Eastern time, she was then away for seven months and arrived back in course of about three weeks ago. Uh, so she's been around the globe, she's mainly been operating down in the India Pacific region, uh, but she's now back here in course and she's probably going to be here for quite a few months. Prince of Wales, however, now, given that she is the newer one of the two, she's therefore a little bit further behind in the whole schedule. She's actually not due to enter service or active service until next year. Uh, we believe she'll probably go at a similar time to the Queen Elizabeth this, so around Easter time, and we'll probably spend a very similar length of time out on her maiden deployment, so she could be back around Christmas time next year, if that's sort of the plan they decide to go down. But uh, she finished her trials in October and uh, officially is in service, just waiting now to go on her front line. Now, when she does, it will be very much like her sister ship in the fact that she will carry on board her a crew of up to 1,600. That's all in order to fly up to 40 aircraft on her. Now the aircraft or fighter jet's choice for these new suit carriers is the Lockheed Martin's F-35B Lightning II jet. Now first and foremost, these are an American aircraft. They're built and designed by a company called Lockheed Martin and uh, they're considered by many to be one of the most advanced aircraft in the world. In fact, currently, they are pretty much the only fifth generation fighter jet around. They cost in a region of 100 million pounds per aircraft. They have a top speed of Mach 1.6, about 1,200 miles an hour, and they can fly to height of up to 50,000 feet, which is about 10 to 20,000 feet higher than what most commercial airlines would fly when they take you off on your holidays. But, arguably one of the main reasons we went for the F-35s and the B variant in particular though is because the B variant operates with a system on board known as STOVL or S-T-O-V-L. This stands for short takeoff and vertical landing. In essence, 
What it means when the aircraft want to take off, they don't need a very long run up. In fact, all they really require is a ski ramp you can see up on the bow here. That is designed to help get them into the sky carrying heavier payload marks. However, coming to land is a completely different ball game. 280 metres isn't a very long runway, especially when you compare it to someone like Gatwick or Heathrow, for example. So, to avoid the aircraft from touching down on the far end and then falling off the front here, well, they have one of two options. The first option is to do what the Americans do, uh, which is the rest of the wire system, basically cable strung out along the flight deck. The aircraft hook onto them as they come into land and it brings them to a nice and controlled stop. However, there are various implications to using that system, so instead, we decided to go back to what we always have done, and that's to use vertical landing aircraft. So, the F 35B is basically just a newer version of the old Sea Harrier jump jets, and they just hover down the side of the carrier. When they're lined up, they plonk themselves onto the deck space nice and safely, and generally, it's a pretty safe system to use. So, that's the reason we went for the F 35Bs as the aircraft of choice. Right. We're moving away from the carrier for now. We will come back to them a little bit later on, but next up, P281 quickly. It's HMS Time. She is one of three Batch 1 River Class patrol ships in service for the Navy. And these ships have been around since about 2003 and have spent most of their life here in the UK involved in what's known as fisheries protection. So they go around UK waters making sure all the fishermen adhere to all the rules and regulations. But they also do coastal patrols as well. And in fact, one of the sister ships for these was uh, actually used down in the Falkland Isles for most of its life, going around the Falkland Isles making sure everything was adhered to down there as well. Anyway, moving away from the patrol boats, just up ahead of us, or here on our right is D-37, and up ahead of us are two of our sister ships, D-35 and 34. These are what we call Daring Class Type 45, so 37 here is the Duncan, 35 is the Dragon, and 34 is the Diamond. So the Type 45s, well they've been around since about 2009. At the time of construction, they were the most expensive warships in the Navy, costing in excess of a billion pounds each. Now, the main role of our Type 45 destroyers is for air defence. They are therefore designed to track and find missiles and aircraft that fly in the skies around our fleet. To do so, these ships are quite renowned for carrying on board them, one of if not the most powerful missile and aircraft tracking system on board any warship in the world. And most notably, is the big grey ball up on the top of the tallest mast. So, that's called the Samson Multifunction Radar System. That thing has a scanning range of over 200 miles. 200 miles away from here in Portsmouth, it's about Paris. So, come to the uh, see the Eiffel Tower. Now, within that range, you can monitor over 3,000 football-sized objects travelling three times the speed of sound. It can then relay the information back in 3D to the clever computers on board, which could then prioritise their targets. And if a threat is ever detected, the ship can then launch off its own missiles to go and destroy whatever that target is that they have found. Now the missiles are known as the Aster-15 and Aster-30s. They are located inside this grey box you can see here up to the front of the ship. Carry 40 of them in total. They get launched out vertically into the edge of Earth's atmosphere they then use the information gathered by that Samson radar system to be guided to their targets. Now, this is where the Type 45s truly excel. Traditionally, with destroyers, they're only ever really capable of uh, locking onto and sending a missile towards one target at a time. So, one aeroplane, one missile at a time. However, these Type 45s can engage up to 16 targets at once. And they can launch off all of those missiles, all 16 of them, into the edge of the atmosphere in about 10 seconds. So they are very, very powerful bits of kits. Uh, they're actually so good they cover the role of about 10 American destroyers known as the Arleigh Burke class. This is why they're truly one of the most powerful ships they're kind of around. So that's obviously the main weapon system on board. The whole thing's known as the Sea Viper system, but there are other things on here as well. You will notice at the middle of the ship that little white dome structure. That is called a Vulcan Phalanx close-in weapon system. This is in essence a high-powered radar-controlled Gatling gun. It's capable of spreading out some 3,500 rounds a minute, which works out to about 57 bullets a second, and it creates a wall of steel about 200 metres off the side of the ship. So that's one of the last line of defence is uh, all these type of fights. And then as we come towards the bow or the front of the ship, you will see probably the most iconic weapon on board, which is, of course, the 
big great cannon up on the front. So this is called a Vickers Mark 8, four and a half inch naval sea gun. This thing is capable of launching off a 22 kilogram high explosive quick fire round with pinpoint accuracy as far away as 17.1 miles. Now about 17 miles away from here in Portsmouth is around about Southampton. So if they wanted to, they could swing the barrels around, aim it towards Southampton and completely level any building within the city. So we could say, for the sake of the argument, St. Mary Stadium. Anyway, folks, moving away from our Type 45s. This is now the final stretch of Naval Key Wall here in Port. It's known as Fountain Lake Jetties 1, 2, 3 and 4. And alongside Jetty 1 and 2 are two of our Duke class of Type 23 frigates. So F78 is HMS Kent, 229 is HMS Lancaster. Both of these are Duke class of Type 23 frigates. The frigates are actually some of the oldest ships we have. They've been around since the late 1980s. Now, when these ships were first introduced into our fleet, their primary role was intended to be what's known as ASW. This stands for Anti-Submarine Warfare. Basically, frigates are submarine hunters. So, what they do is they'll go off into hostile waters, ahead of the fleet, they'll deploy a sonar radar over the back of the boat, drag it on behind them, hopefully use that to then find the submarines. If they don't detect a threat, they can either tell the rest of the fleet, like, hey, look over there, there's a submarine, don't go near it, or they can try and take it out themselves. And to do so, there's two systems on board these ships they carry. The first one is probably the most obvious, which is the torpedoes. The torpedoes are located behind this sort of little hatch you can see on the back third of the ship. So look at the superstructure, you see how it's split up into three sections. On the back third, just above, between the brakes, you'll see it's all like a little hatch on the side. It's behind the hatches where the torpedoes are. The other system is the Mark 11 depth chargers. They're located below the waterline, so unfortunately you can't see them. But over the past couple of years, the frigates have had to find a way to other lines of work as well. Our Navy's become a lot smaller than what it once was. Nowadays, these ships are actually what's known as multi-role ships. So they go around the globe doing a variety of different jobs. What makes them so good at this is the fact they're actually really heavily armed. They carry a lot of weapon systems, therefore are able to deal with a variety of different threats. So as we come towards the bow of the uh, Lancaster here, you will see most of those weapon systems in place. And obviously, starting right from the front, you've got the big grey cannon once again. That is the Vickers Mark 8. That is the exact same gun that you would have seen on the bow of the Type 45s. Behind that is a rather familiar looking grey box with the doors on the side of it. That is the housing for the anti-aircraft Sea Scepter system, which is a slightly older version, or slightly less capable version, shall I say, of the Type 45 Sea Viper system. The racks behind that, which are currently empty on board the Lancaster, but I believe they're in place on the Kent, there's usually four anti-ship harpoon missiles there, and then amidships you've got the 30mm auto cannon on the balcony structure there on the side. So, very heavily armed, very well rounded ships, able to deal with a variety of different jobs, and that's the reason it's kind of made up the backbone the Royal Naval Fleet itself. Right, that is pretty much the end of the naval base. Um, the very end of it is marked out by the sandy coloured round tower just up on our right hand side. Before we get to that point, just the other side of the keel, the final ship within the base, is the former RFA Diligence. The Diligence was a forward repair ship and they spent you to go along and repair any broken down warships. Unfortunately, though, her days of working alongside the Navy has come to an end because a few years ago she was deemed a surplus to requirements. So as it stands, she's currently laid up where you see her, been here for a very long time, and uh, the Royal Navy is still trying to decide what they want to do with her. Who knows? Right, like I say, that is the end of the Navy base, marked out by the sandy coloured uh, round tower here. From that point on, which you actually enter into the commercial part of the harbour. The first part of which, where you can see the white ship alongside and the sheds behind them, is an area known as Portico. Portico is Porter's small container port. And here in Porto, we import and export a large variety of goods. Traditionally, it's always been fresh fruit, and in particular bananas that come in and out of Porto. But over the past couple of years, we've actually expanded the variety of things that come and go. So we still import fresh fruit, not quite as much as we used to, but we also now import aggregate, which as you can see the piles of it up on the uh, key wall at the moment, and wind turbine blades is a very cool one as well. That's because the blades are actually built on the Isle of Wight, they then get transported here to Portsmouth and they then go from Portsmouth across to usually uh, 
Uh, they usually go to the Netherlands, I believe. So, uh, so sort of uh, midway point before they get shipped over to Europe. Anyway, next door to Port Goat, Z Port is International Port, often referred to as the Crosshell Ferry Port because it's the second busiest Crosshell Ferry Port in the UK, of course. Coming will be second to Dover. It's a little bit hard to believe at the moment, however, because we have no Crosshell Ferries alongside. Um, there is usually a reason why they're not here at this time of day. The main reason is because of the uh, length of time it takes to cross the English Channel. So what they often do is they sail first thing in the morning, about 8, 9 o'clock. It then takes about five, six hours to cross the English Channel. Therefore, they don't usually arrive here in Porto until 2 o'clock in the afternoon. So probably in the next hour or so, we'll hear the cross channel ferry start calling up saying they're ready to come to Portsmouth. So uh, unfortunately that's why there's nothing here at the moment, but in an hour or two there'll probably be one or two alongside. Anyway, leaving the commercial port now behind us, going back to the Navy quickly, here on the right is the former HMS Bristol. She was the only Bristol class destroyer to ever be built, and that's because back in the 60s, due to the fence cuts, her three sister ships were all scrapped on paper. However, during her lifetime in the Navy, she was the escort to the aircraft carriage during the Falklands. She was also the Hong Kong guard ship for a number of years. In the early days, she eventually found herself to be decommissioned, only then to be recommissioned a few years later as a static training ship, which is what she was right up until the end of last year. At the end of last year, though, she was completely removed from service, laid up where you see her now, and is currently waiting to be sold on for scrap metal. So a bit of a sorry fate for her, but she has been around for a very long time.